So, welcome back. Welcome to the quantum metrology session of BQIT. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Jonathan Matthews. I'm one of the lecturers in CQP. I'm one of the group leaders, and my research interests are in photonic quantum metrology. That's a field uh, which has been impacted greatly by uh, some of the research by our first speaker, Morgan Mitchell. It's my pleasure to introduce him. Uh, he's traveled to us today, uh, this morning, from Barcelona, from his group. Uh, his expertise uh, cover quite a lot of ground, uh, notably his contributions to generating and using noon states. And today he's going to talk about quantum enhanced sensing with optimized particle numbers. So take it away, Morgan. Okay. So thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, it's actually my first visit to, to Bristol, and there's so much amazing work that's come out of the, uh, the, the research groups here. It's, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a, a topic in quantum metrology that uses atoms and uses photons in order to sense especially magnetic fields, but because I'm giving the first talk on this, on this topic, uh, I will make it a little bit broader. Uh, in fact, I will start out very broadly. Uh, so I'm talking about quantum enhanced sensing, which is somehow a subtopic within the broader uh, topic of quantum metrology, which is anything that has to do with measurement and takes advantage of quantum effects. And if you look at metrology institutes, so for example, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in the US or the National Physical Laboratory here in the UK, then they have quantum metrology activities, and that includes some quantum enhanced sensing, but it also includes a lot of things that have to do with standards. Uh, so for example, in 2018, the metric system is expected to go to a definition of the ampere that's based on the charge of the electron. And that's a contribution to quantum metrology, to the definition of standards, which has an enormous impact. And if you think about what parts of the economy are underlain by quantum technologies, you realize that it's almost everything. So for example, maybe you go to see your psychoanalyst and you think, well, there's, not, there's no quantum technology in seeing your psychoanalyst, right? There's some economy there, but where's the quantum technology? And then, you're, then your psychoanalyst says to you that famous phrase, I'm sorry, but it's time. We have to stop now. And what you realize is that you've spent one hour with your psychoanalyst, and that hour is defined by the oscillation of a cesium atom somewhere uh, in, in these metrology institutes. So, a lot of what interests me in quantum metrology is the possibility to have an impact on technologies which are really extremely broad, which is uh, somehow uh, a bit different than some of the, the things that I've heard this morning, where people are trying to invent new technologies to solve problems that don't have any solution now. We're trying to improve uh, things which, which often do have a solution, but which can be improved with, with quantum techniques. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the thing that I know best, which is atomic sensors, and I'm going to put it in comparison to gravitational wave detectors, which is where the, the effort has been for the longest period of time. And the outline of my talk is going to include a quantum information version, because I think that will be the most accessible thing, and then pass to a quantum optics version, which better describes what's actually happening in these instruments, and then the new thing that I'm talking about, which is a number-optimized version of the quantum metrology problem. Okay. So these, these instruments uh, are interferometers, uh, and an interferometer is often idealized like this, that you have some number of particles that enter the system. They experience some phase shift, depending on which path they're in, whatever path means in your interferometer, and then they leave, and then you detect them. And I think we all know that when you have n particles, then if they're not entangled, if you're not using quantum correlations, then you have the best, at best, the standard quantum limit sensitivity, this one over square root of n. And if you maximally use quantum correlations, then you can get to the Heisenberg limit where the uncertainty in estimating the phase goes as 1 over n. And this, this topic has benefited from the interaction with quantum information. You can prove things using, uh, using quantum information techniques. For example, this is a very nice paper in, in 2006 where they used a quantum circuit approach and they showed that if your n particles come in in, in uh, some, some kind of non-entangled state, 
then they interact with the environment through a Hamiltonian, which couples to each of them in the same way to some unknown parameter x here, and then you do measurements on them, and then you analyze the result, then you can show that the best you can do is the standard quantum limit. You can also ask, what if you have quantum technologies available to you, if you have a quantum computer at the input, then it's possible to, re to reach the Heisenberg limit. It's not possible to do better than the Heisenberg limit. These things can be proven. You can also prove that having a quantum computer in the detector stage, in the detection stage, is not an interesting thing. And so it's really the, the state that you're putting in uh, that is interesting. Okay. And so along this, this direction, uh, looking at the Heisenberg limit as being a fundamental limit, looking at this difference in scaling between these two. People have done a lot of work, especially in photonic, uh, photonic quantum sensing. Uh, and uh, it was already mentioned that we had an early paper in, in this area, but for many years this was a really nice way to get your paper into science or, or nature, uh, especially science, was to generate <laughs> some version of a noon state and use it for some kind of interferometry. Okay. But as we go toward technologies and away from, from, fundamental, uh, from fundamental questions, then it becomes interesting to ask how well can you actually do with this. And so again, we're looking at these uh, uncertainties that can be achieved, and with the best noon state, you can get n equals to 10. And if you use the best non-entangled state, then a typical number for an experiment in a simple laboratory would be 10 to the 12th. And so comparing these two, it's quite obvious that the sensitivity that you get is better using, using this technique, okay? And so if you look at a practical technology like LIGO, they're not trying to create the largest noon state that they can, they're trying to get a very large number of photons into their system, and that's their, their starting point, okay? Nevertheless, there are quantum things that you can do to improve that scenario, and that's uh, where I'm going with the, with the rest of the talk. Okay, so I want to move from this quantum information uh, picture to a more quantum optics picture, which is in fact exactly the same thing, but I have some kind of linear dynamics that is describing my interferometer, and I'm going to put in some number of particles, and I'm allowed to decide what quantum state they go in. The universe decides some unknown thing that I'm trying to measure, which might be the, the curvature of space-time, or it might be a magnetic field, and then out are going to come some, some observables. Okay. And so here's an example of how that, that works out in practice. This is a uh, Michelson interferometer, as in, the, in LIGO, and a laser enters, it gets split into two paths, there's some small phase difference between the paths, they're recombined on the same beam splitter, and some of that power comes out to a detector, and you're trying to infer from the power on the detector what this phase was, what the phase difference between the arms is. And in the quantum mechanical description, your laser is described by a coherent state, and so that in the analysis that's provided by Carl Caves in, in 1981 is essentially perfect. The, the noise from, from this does not play an important role. Where does the noise actually come from in, in the interferometer? It comes in in a surprising way. It comes in through this unused port. What happens is vacuum fluctuations enter into the system. These also get split on the beam splitter, experience the phase shift, and come back out. And so what you get on your detector is a combination of this laser, which may be extremely clean, with the vacuum fluctuations, and it's the interference of those two things that leads to the noise that you see on your detector. Okay? And that picture, quantum optical picture, leads to a solution or an improvement, a quantum advantage here, which is to take a parametric amplifier, which is a device that is a phase-sensitive amplifier, and you can use that to amplify your vacuum fluctuations at some point in time and de-amplify them at other points in time. And then you feed that into your interferometer here, and what comes out will now be capable of interfering in a more advantageous way. In particular, you can put the noise at the zero crossings of the laser, and so the less noisy points are at the peaks, and it doesn't change very much the power in, uh, that you detect here. Okay. And that is a way that you can maintain 
the sensitivity, you can maintain the, the re signal response to this phase while reducing the noise. Okay? And this is the strategy that, that's used in, in LIGO and in other uh, squeezed, squeezed light improved instruments. So that was first put into full practice in the GEO 600 instrument in 2011. And here you see their sensitivity, so which is to say the smallest signal that they could see, so smaller is better as a function of frequency. The gravitational waves themselves are somewhere down here at about 200, kilo, 200 hertz. This is technical noise and seismic noise. This, however, the straight line here is the shot noise. And what you can see is this black line is without their squeezer and the red line is with their squeezer. And they improved their sensitivity by about a factor of two in, in, uh, uh, by, by turning on their squeezer in that application, okay? And so this was the first full-scale instrument. This was the first time that something that people built for a real purpose was improved uh, using, uh, using a, a quantum, uh, using squeezing, using a, a quantum advantage. Okay. Then in 2013, the Americans uh, got, got caught up and they uh, were able to put squeezed light into one of the LIGO instruments and they saw here an improvement, uh, not quite as large as, as the, the German improvement, but the sensitivity of their instrument is, is already uh, much better. And so this is in some way a, a more significant improvement on, on, the, uh, on the sensitivity. Okay, the uh, Americans were also able to do something that the Germans did not succeed in doing, which was that they got all three colors of their flag into a single graph. <laughs> and I understand that the Germans are working on upgrading their instrument so that they can do the same thing. <laughs> okay, uh, so there are people here that are working on radically changing the performance of, for example, computers and computing tasks and searches and things like that, uh, changing not small, some small prefactor, but changing the exponent in the, 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 the time that it takes to do things. What is a factor of two worth? Is it really worth putting all this effort to get a factor of two? And uh, the simple answer to that is it is worth it for these instruments. Um, and it's because a factor of two allows you to see a factor of two farther into the universe. The universe is three-dimensional, so that means you're going to see eight times as many events in the same amount of time. And when you consider how much it costs to build LIGO and how much it costs to keep it running, that ends up being a significant amount of money. Okay? So talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so that is a, a, a reason to do this, even though the advantage that you get may look very small from a quantum information perspective. Okay. So detecting gravitational waves is wonderful, but uh, it doesn't have a lot of commercial application. And so there are people that are working on improving the, the performance of other technologies. Uh, there's interesting work on atomic clocks. Uh, our work is, is on optical magnetometers. There is one of the, the leading areas of the field in, in the last years is work on uh, atom interferometers, which are then sensitive to gravity. And the Stanford team in particular reported last year an improvement by 20 decibels in the noise in, in um, uh, due, they squeezed their atomic sample by 20 decibels, which is to say by a factor of 100 uh, in, in a cavity QED ex experiment. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about magnetic sensing because that's our, our topic. So what we do is we take an ensemble of atoms, so it's a, a collection of magnetically sensitive atoms, the interesting degree of freedom is going to be the collective spin, so the total spin of this entire ensemble of atoms. And when there's a magnetic field present, then that spin will change its direction due to some mechanism or other, so that it acquires a component that is along the direction that we are probing with linearly polarized light. And so the, li the light will experience a polarization rotation, the Faraday rotation, by an angle which is proportional to the component of the spin that's along that direction, okay? So the magnetic field affects the atoms, the atoms affect the light, that's what we see is the rotation of the light. 
And if you recognize this, uh, this linear rotation and then detection in 45 degree basis, you can see that that is a polarization interferometer and it's in fact completely analogous to what you have in a Michelson interferometer, uh, just that the, the phase is applied not between two arms but between left and right circular polarization and the beam splitter is split into two different, uh, two different pieces. Okay. So this technique uh, optically detected magnetic response of a collection of atoms, it looks very complicated, uh, but that's what we have. Why do we have that? Because this is the most sensitive technique that the world has for detecting low frequency magnetic fields. Okay. Why do you want to detect low frequency magnetic fields? This is one reason. This is an instrument that you can find in hospitals. It costs about a million euros. It's got a giant cryostat here. The, the patient or the subject puts their head into this machine. Uh, in their head, in their brain, the electrical signals that are associated with whatever brain activity you want to study are producing electrical currents and thus magnetic fields. Those magnetic fields pass nicely outside of the head because the head does not act as a magnetic shielding. And in this instrument, they're detected with squids. In this commercial instrument, they're detected with these superconducting magnetic field sensors, and a collection of them. Okay. And so that's an instrument that you can find in hospitals. It's used for epilepsy diagnosis. It's used for research that it's the only real-time three-dimensional technique we have for studying brain activity uh, non-invasively. Okay, um, but it, in fact, atomic sensors are, are better for this task. So if I compare here an atomic magnetometer, this is, this is from uh, a startup company that is, is selling these things. If I compare an atomic magnetometer here detecting a heart signal, uh, this is a heart signal with the atomic magnetometer. This is the same thing with the squid, and you see that they give you the same response. This is a brain signal. Uh, so this person was told to open and close their eyes uh, every 10 seconds, I think. And you can see the difference between eyes open, eyes closed, eyes open, eyes closed. Uh, it might be surprising, you're, but it's well known by brain researchers that your brain is much more active when your eyes are closed than when your eyes are open. Okay? So if I see people out there with your eyes closed, I know it's because your brain is very actively processing my talk. <laughs> Okay, um, there, there are other advantages. This is two atomic magnetometers, so there's one here, it's, there's a cell that's about this big. Uh, here's a second atomic magnetometer, and this thing here is part of the doer, part of the, the cryostat for uh, one of these squid sensors. Okay? So they're, they're just much smaller, lower power, they're essentially better in every way. Um, they haven't yet gone into commercial applications. So the squids got there first. They have the, the moment, they have the, the inertia, and, uh, and, and it might be some time before the atomic physicists convince the companies that make these things uh, to, to go to atomic devices. Okay. So uh, the first thing I want to show you is that you can improve the sensitivity of one of these devices with squeezed light. So again, we have this polarization interferometer. The Faraday rotation that's produced here is, it, that, that gives us our signal is produced in a cell of rubidium vapor here. And we want to do the same strategy as LIGO in order to improve the sensitivity here. And so what does that mean? That means that we have a laser which is coming in one port and is giving us our signal and we have squeezed vacuum which comes in this port which is going to reduce our noise. Okay. And the squeezed vacuum is produced in the, the usual way that we have a nonlinear optical process here. We have an optical parametric oscillator. It's run below threshold. It becomes a phase sensitive amplifier. Vacuum fluctuations enter via this port. They get squeezed, they come out. And so here we have vertically polarized squeezed vacuum. And we also take from this laser uh, to get, the, uh, to get the, the, the laser beam, which we bring in here, and this interferometer is from this PBS through the, the rotator to the second PBS, which has a half-way plate, so it's detecting in the 45, minus 45 basis, and then we do a balanced detection. 
Uh, we also do some other tricks that we <coughs> feed back to maintain the phase between the, the laser and the squeezed vacuum at the phase which reduces our, our noise. Okay. The sensor itself is very, very simple in this first experiment. It's just a cell that contains rubidium-87 and we pass the laser beam through at, and we pass the laser and the squeezed light through both tuned a bit to the blue of the atomic resonance and that allows us to probe with some resonant enhancement but not so close that we're getting absorption of the beam and that's necessary to, pr to preserve the squeezing. <coughs> then this is our signal which is somehow the uh, analog of the, the LIGO signal that when we have the squeezer off, we see this noise background. Oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. We, we apply here an artificial signal for calibration purposes. And you can see the artificial signal here and also here. And this is the noise background. And you see that when we turn on the squeezer, we get about a factor of two improvement in signal to noise ratio. Uh, the signal doesn't actually go down, but the noise does. So now I'd like to switch to the new topic, which I think will probably be difficult. Um, it's taken me about 10 years in this field in order to even understand that this topic was, was important or what this topic was. Um, so when we look at a, one of these instruments, then they have photon numbers, they have particle numbers that they work at. So the gravitational wave detector, LIGO, works with about 10 to the 21 photons per second. Uh, the atomic sensors tend to work with about 10 to the 13 atoms per cubic centimeter, so a, a certain density of atoms. And it's not because they ran out of photons. It's not because they ran out of atoms. It's not because these things are, are expensive or difficult to obtain. It's because that's the best working point for these instruments. Okay? And if you look at this, the LIGO squeezing paper, then they refer to this article to explain why they don't go to higher photon numbers. And it's because of an optical nonlinearity. So you have inside the cavity, you have the mirrors, and the mirrors themselves can have vibrations in them, which will have different mechanical modes. You have the light, which is bouncing between the mirrors, Excuse me. Sorry, you, you have the mirrors which support their own modes, you have the light which is bouncing between the mirrors, and if the mirror is deformed, then it causes a diffraction of the light so that when it gets back to the mirror, it will have a different power distribution. And that power distribution causes radiation pressure, which can, if there's enough light inside the, the instrument, can uh, cause an amplification of this, uh, uh, of the mechanical uh, deformation. So you have a feedback mechanism, and if you have too much light inside your cavity, then it will start to oscillate. And that's obviously not good for an instrument that is trying to detect very small signals through the motion of the mirrors. In the case of atoms, it's even more interesting that this is the first uh, publication that beat a squid with an atomic magnetometer. And the way that they did it was to look at the effect of atomic collisions on the coherence time of these instruments. And so here, the, the physics is a little bit complicated, but here you can see this is the atom number density. This is a, these are theory calculations, but the experiment supports it. Uh, so this is the atom number density, and this is the sensitivity that they predict in the optical magnetometer. And at first, as you increase the density, then the sensitivity remains flat. You're adding atoms, but as you add atoms, you're increasing the density and thus the collisions, and that reduces the coherence. And then a different kind of physics takes over, and the collisions actually start to help you, and it starts to, to travel down this curve, okay? And then finally, a, a third kind of collision takes over, and it flattens off again, 
Okay? And so this 10 to the 13 is the working point here, and it's determined by the fact that there are different kinds of physics that happen when you put different densities of atoms into your instrument. Okay? And in fact, the, that interaction in this system is very beneficial. The sensitivity improves by a couple of orders of magnitude due to these collisional effects. Okay? So now, now we are very far from the simple uh, model that comes from quantum information, and we're also outside the model, the linear model that we had from, uh, from, from quantum optics. Okay. So going back to, to this model, I had here N as something given to me. This was some finite resource that I was not allowed to change. I'm now going to move this over here onto, into the things that I can control. Okay. And now, instead of, uh, so I'm, I'm going to allow this to become nonlinear because I see that is happening in these real instruments, and I'm going to apply optimization. I'm going to choose both of these things in order to get the, both the best performance from my instrument. Okay? So this is the model that I think should be applied to these real instruments, to any scenario in which you uh, are not limited by some external uh, effect on the number of particles that you can use in your system. Okay? And that describes important instruments. Okay. So the optimization will give us something like this. We're changing n, and so we, we find the point at which it's maximum. So clearly this is, uh, this is the optimization condition. That means that these previously defined standard quantum limit, Heisenberg limit, they clearly don't apply because neither of those has this, this character. Okay, so things are going to be very different in the number optimized scenario. Okay, so uh, just this is very different. So to get oriented on this, let's look at this in the LIGO scenario. So we're going to send in n photons here, and we're going to have some small phase shift. So I'm in the linear regime uh, for for phase and number, and I'm going to ask what happens if this remains linear. And what I'm going to see is first that my signal power will be the square of this, okay? And if I look at my noise power, it's going to have three contributions. The first will be a contribution from the detector itself, so something which is there even if I send no light into the interferometer. And you might say, well, but that's not fundamental. And I say, well, but it's unavoidable. And unless you can give me a detector which has no noise at all, there's going to be a term like that. Then there's the quantum noise contribution, which has this scaling. And then there's a technical noise, which will have this scaling. So the technical noise would be anything that looks like this phase that I'm trying to detect. And that could be, for example, a seismic, uh, a seismic vibration of this, this intermediate beam splitter. So again, there's nothing fundamental about that, but it's also unavoidable. So it, it has to be there in my model. Okay. So this is, this is what I get. And this is, a, this is a generic description for any linear interferometer or, in fact, any linear detection system. And this is, this is we, we see this, for example, when we characterize our detectors. That we see a part that scales as n to the 0, a shot noise part that scales as n to the 1, a technical noise part that scales as n to the 2, while our signal is always scaling as n to the 2. Okay? So if we want to optimize the signal to noise ratio here, then what are we trying to do? We're trying to increase as much as possible the separation between this line and that line by choice of number of photons, okay? And you can probably see from this, or you can calculate it yourself, the answer is with this model is always to go to n equals infinity, and then your signal-to-noise ratio uh, is determined just by the ratio of your technical noise to the, the gain uh, in, in your uh, in your, your interferometer, okay? And there's nothing quantum mechanical about that. So the conclusion would be that number-optimized linear interferometers are not quantum devices, okay? So for quantum metrology, that would be very disappointing. However, we also know that we're not talking about linear devices. That there's always a, a nonlinear part here. Okay. So... Um, some work with, uh, with number-optimized instruments has been done. So this is in, 
a, an experiment that was done a couple of years after ours, where they had a squeezer and a magnetometer, and they changed the number density in the magnetometer. And what they saw was, as you increase the atom number, then your sensitivity, so again, lower is better, uh, your sensitivity improves, and then at some point it turns around. So there is an optimum for the operation of this device. And then they turn on their squeezer, and it helps, it helps, it helps, it helps, it helps. Whoops, it starts to hurt, okay? And if you look at the optimum, though it's not clear exactly where the optimum is, but in fact, without squeezer worked better than with squeezer, okay? And so that's, that's also very disturbing. So that, it's looking bad for number optimized uh, instruments, at least for number optimized atomic instruments. Okay. And then in the few minutes that I, that I have left, I wanna show you that we have some hope now and we think that, that this can be done. So the first thing is that we made a, a better magnetometer. We, uh, we collaborated with a group in Poland that had experience with very high sensitivity magnetometers. Uh, it looks like this. There's an this is the atomic ensemble. It's optically pumped in order to generate a large polarization, and then it's probed by Faraday rotation probing. And all of this is done uh, in, a, in a synchronous fashion at a, at a particular frequency. And when that frequency agrees with the Larmor precession frequency of the atoms, then you get this resonance, which is very clean and very easy to interpret. And the sensitivity that you get is a combination of the strength of the signal and its width, which give you this slope, and the noise that you have in the readout, which you can see here uh, by, this is, this is a, a spectrum analyzer trace of the signal uh, in terms of the signal to noise ratio. And it gives you something very simple that the uncertainty in the magnetic field is a bunch of physical constants times the width divided by the signal to noise ratio. And then we studied that as a function first of probe power, sorry, in this experiment only probe power, the number is, is constant. We studied this as a function of probe power, and we see that the sensitivity does in fact have an optimum, and we understand, and it's, it's a good optimum, so it's better than the picotesla per root hertz that, um, that was seen by the, by, by the previous group. It's also the best sensitivity that one can have for measuring such strong fields as we're measuring here. <coughs> and the reason is that in this part of uh, for, for these low powers, in, increasing the power gives you more signal, and then when you get up here, increasing the power causes a power broadening and gives you more line width and thus less slope. Okay. So that, that gives us an optimum, and so we've somehow satisfied the, the conditions here, and we see that this instrument is, it's possible to optimize it, it's possible for it to have high sensitivity, and more important for us, it's also shot noise limited, so that it's something which could be improved with squeezing, okay? But that experiment was in Poland, our experiments are in Barcelona, uh, it was not easy to move either experiment in both directions, so we started building our own. That's what this, this looks like. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I don't think I'll tell you uh, <coughs> all of the details here. But this is a, a device which is designed to be the, to work in this high collision regime, and will be able to um, and will be able to achieve sensitivities at the, the femtotesla level. And then we've recently done an experiment with spin noise spectroscopy in order to see that a number optimized optimized instrument can in fact uh, be, be quantum enhanced and, uh, and work at its optimum point. Okay, so the spin noise spectroscopy looks exactly like the magnetometer. The difference is that the atoms are not initially polarized. So you just have thermal noise to, to measure. And what you see looks just like a magnetic resonance signal that here, for example, is, is a signal from one isotope of rubidium. Here's another isotope of ru rubidium. And what's interesting here, you again have a photon shot noise background. You have a contribution from the spin noise. You have a Larmor frequency, which may be what you're trying to measure. You have a width. And to understand how well you can measure these things, the appropriate figure of, no figure of merit is the signal to noise divided by the width. So this is the figure of merit that uh, would tell you, for example, the precision with which you can measure the Larmor frequency. So we take again our squeezer, 
we use it in this high sensitivity, uh, well shielded environment in order to do the spin noise spectroscopy. This is a spin noise signal with uh, coherent state. We turn on the squeezer, we get again about three decibels of improvement in, in the signal to noise. The squeezing, this is the squeezing before interaction with the atoms, this is the squeezing after interaction with the atoms. At low densities, we keep all of the squeezing, but we can still keep some squeezing up to about two decibels at 10 to the 13, uh, uh, density of 10 to the 13, which is then a, a good operating point. <laughs> we see that the signal to noise ratio improves with the squeezing, uh, sorry, this is as a function of power, we see that the squeezing helps both in signal to noise ratio and our figure of merit. And this is the, the really important slide, that as a function of atomic density, we see that our figure of merit turns over so that we can identify an optimum point here. And we can see that when we turn on the squeezer, we clearly beat that. At this density, we still get about 1.7 decibels of, of improvement. And so we can say that this is a number optimized instrument where a quantum advantage is possible. Okay? So at that point, I would say that we have resolved this question of whether it is possible to improve a number optimized instrument. Okay, so to conclude, uh, I would say most real world instruments have particle number not as a constraint, but as a parameter. And we have to take seriously that, uh, that scenario if we want to do quantum enhanced sensing with this these kinds of instruments, which are important instruments. When optimized for number, uh, scaling considerations go out the window. The, 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 the usual picture is, is clearly somehow qualitatively inappropriate to describe these situations. Uh, it is possible to improve, uh, it's, it's possible for number optimized instruments to be quantum noise limited, it's possible for them to be quantum enhanced. And uh, in the next steps, we want to go to ultra sensitive magnetometry and show that a, a, a magnetometer, which is both extremely sensitive and as good as it can be, can be improved through squeezing techniques. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I would like to thank my team, who are uh, these, these people. Um, especially uh, Frederica and Joanna built the squeezer and, uh, sorry, they built the current version of the squeezer and Ricardo and uh, Gian Vito uh, built the, the magnetometer. And uh, we also have some nice fellowships for people that are looking for fellowships. Thank you. Thank you for a, a fascinating talk. Do we have some questions? I'd like to remind um, anybody who's asking questions, please wait for the microphone to come to you as well, please. Um, so I guess my question is, so as far as magnetic sensing is concerned, you show the comparison between atomic sensing and squid. Um, so is the, so it sounded like the atomic sensing is simply better. Is is it true or there are situations or other things about squid and atomic sensing that are sort of not just simply better or worse, but they have different advantages? There, there are many, many dimensions to magnetic sensing. So just, just a few of them. There's the strength of the signal. So it's not the same instrument that you want to use to measure the earth field versus the field that comes from, from uh, some, some uh, material object or what you get from your head. Those would tend to be different instruments because you get different performance for different strength. Uh, it's not the same thing to measure one component of the field or to measure three components of the field. It's not the same thing to measure rapidly changing fields versus slowly changing fields. The atomic magnetometers are better than squids for measuring slowly varying small fields, which happens to coincide with the biomagnetic uh, regime. Um, I'm not sure I understand what changed between the initial uh, experiment in Poland where 
you showed that uh, actually um, at the optimum point squeezing wasn't helping you anymore and your experiment where actually you have um, constant improvement across the, the various numbers. Okay, so this, this is a very good question. Um, so first, uh, I, I don't think I said this clearly enough, this is not our experiment. This is an experiment that was, was done uh, in, in the US. Um, the technology is very different. Their squeezer is a different kind of squeezer. It uses an atomic physics effect. Their magnetometer is a different kind of magnetometer. And the important difference is that they're using uh, near resonant effects and we're using off resonant effects. And so with the near resonant effects, you will get, with, it, with near resonant fields, you will get many other nonlinear optical processes and probably that's the reason why they didn't see this, this improvement. Um, it's a very difficult system to model and I don't think anyone really knows the answer to what was limiting this experiment. Yes. Yeah, this maybe also speaks to the question of squids versus uh, atomic sensors. I mean, you've been talking about optimizing the particle number for the probe light, right? But eventually there is another limitation, which is actually saturation of the atomic ensemble, right? So eventually the volume of the atomic ensemble comes into that equation as well, right? If you have too many atoms in there, there's too many collisions, too much, too much density, and so it might be hard to scale it down to a small size in comparison to a squid. Um, I, you didn't address this issue, so I'm, I'm curious about it. I, I don't. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very good issue. Uh, it's a very good question. There, there are size considerations, and in general, if you make your instrument bigger, then your sensitivity will get better. And uh, the, in, in, but one place where you could clearly make a comparison is where you're trying to measure a field that has a certain structure to it. So for example, if you're trying to do biomagnetics on the head, then the, the structure that you want is centimeter in, in sizes, basically because the head is centimeters in size. And so if you've got a source that's, that's in the middle, then it's gonna produce a pattern which is, is spread over, over centimeters. And taking that into consideration, then the atomic sensor, an atomic sensor that occupies a cubic centimeter is better than a squid that occupies the same cubic centimeter. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. So, this is a fantastic example of a quantum technology, but I'm curious, over the last 10 years or so, I feel like quantum metrology has been kind of diverging from the rest of quantum information. Uh, I didn't see a lot of entanglement or quantum circuits or entropies up there. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I. I think what we're trying to do here is physics. Uh, I think if quantum information can keep pace with that, then it would be a wonderful thing. Um, if not, then we have quite good physics tools for describing what's, what's happening in these, in these systems. Okay, I think uh, let's thank Morgan Mitchell for his talk and for the questions.